so this might get split up into a, a, um, a couple different evenings as we do sometimes when we, especially when we're in kind of uh, unfamiliar territory and we want to make sure that we don't rush through anything that we handle the word of God correctly and, and um, have some friendly discussions and, and so forth and, and so that's what we want to do here. Um, so how many of you tried the thing where you read Revelation 19 yeah and then jump on over to Revelation 21 um, was that just mostly confusing or interesting or did it kind of make sense or your first impression well, like I said last week I can see why you would think that mm -hmm. because of some of the verses but I can also see why you couldn't think that mm -hmm. and then I've been listening to a couple of the Calvary Chapel pastors mm -hmm. on that verse and they just go straight through and when I right. listen to them actually three different ones it sounds logical to me mm -hmm. so but I know what you were talking about the other week so I yeah so I'm interested in today's listen let's, let's dig in and find out then because it's uh, this this is it's, it's not a critical type of thing like I said or anything like that but um, for me it just kind of uh, kind of made sense with um, you know some some big questions that I ran into, and I think I've I've shared before my my journey with going the conventional route and then trying to map it out because of reading some scriptures, some things didn't make sense, and uh, also some of the things that didn't make sense from a traditional dispensational perspective. Are some of the objections too that some of the other groups, like uh, some of the all millennial type people or whatever, might um, run into as well? So I think kind of answered some of that. So in the, in the discussing this, you know, we've talked about the major perspectives last time of uh, all millennialism versus dispensational. Um, premillennialism, um, post mill. We, we discussed some of these major views, and um, this is kind of a this is definitely a dispensational model that I'm kind of proposing. Uh, proposing. And I, the best term I can think of is maybe you know restorationism. There's a you know you can call me a restorationist, a restoricist. I don't know. Um, but dispensational, pre trib pre mill restorationist, I guess. Now, by restorationist, there is a bunch of people out there that are, uh, there's a restorationist movement, a restorational movement that has to do with people recovering from demon possession and all that kind of stuff, and it's in charismatic circles or whatever, and it's not that. It's more of this kind of model here that um, I wanted us to kind of examine. And, and question and, and see. So, um, so regarding the, the um, millennial kingdom, I wanted to look at some of these verses that we mentioned before. And um, there are some key verses that I'd like to look at, and then maybe we sit and look at the whole passage, and hopefully you can see kind of some of the stuff um, from what I was talking about before. So in, in Revelation chapter 21, there's some interesting things to call out about um, New Jerusalem. Again, New Jerusalem in the classic dispensational model, traditional model, we'll tend to see chapter 21 as after the millennium. In other words, you've had this tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation, and Christ returns, you have, after Christ returns, and you've, all the saints have been celebrating and feasting in heaven, come back to earth with Christ because we're supposed to return with him, right? The bride of Christ is supposed to return with him. We're supposed to, the saints are supposed to return with him. And he's supposed to tabernacle on the earth. And so he, we come back with him. And, um, 
If there's the, uh, it, it fits the Hebrew wedding traditional, um, Hebrew wedding tradition model where the uh, bride is presented as the wife and then you go into the marriage supper. So the marriage supper of the Lamb would be the public supper that happens at the end of the one week of marriage ceremony and it's the public one that the father's doors are open and everybody comes out and hey here this is the bride now wife of the groom she takes the veil off yeah everybody knows who she is anyway it might even be a sheer veil and then there's the public um, supper and and um, then you go into the thousand years or the, the millennial kingdom and then chapter 21. Well, here we got chapter 21, which ostensibly is when we read, if we were to read chapter 20 in a chronological order and not consider it parenthetical, then we've had the thousand year reign. We've also had um, Satan was bound for a thousand years, but then after the thousand years, he's loosed for a brief season. He gathers up some unbelievers among the mortals who are still living upon the earth. And there's a rebellion that's quickly put down by Christ at a word, fire down from heaven, it's over. Then the, you've, you've got the great white throne judgment. After the great white throne judgment, that's it. Um, the saints are judged, but all the unbelievers are judged. Um, Satan is thrown in with the false prophet, the Antichrist. All the other unbelievers are there. And um, I suppose what happens at that point, too, is that the mortal believers at that point will get their glorified bodies and we go into eternity, future, whatever that looks like. And then you've got chapter 21, though. So everybody at this point... Um, if you were to follow up in a chronological order, should have glorified bodies, there's no unbelievers, there's nothing, you're going into eternity future. Okay, so here in chapter 21, you've got this big description of New Jerusalem. And the traditional model would have us believe that New Jerusalem is after the millennium. Okay? So here in verse 24, reading about New Jerusalem, it says, By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring the glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. As Christ has a throne there, right? So it's going to be glowing. It's going to be shining forth the glory of God. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the, the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it's interesting, you could just say, well, that's just a note that, yeah, of course, only the pure are in there anymore because um, that's all that's left on the earth. I guess you'd have to say that. Okay, let's look at some more, though. It's kind of interesting that it would say that. Look at up ahead into chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, if you have your Bibles open. Um, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Again, talking about New Jerusalem. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So if that is after the millennium, how does that work? Can't be after the great white throne. Can't be after the great white throne, exactly. Let's, let's keep going here. These are some of the things I read, and I'm going, how does this, how does this work? Okay. Um, so, looking at the, the new heaven and new earth, which is where I started off when I was trying to break all this down. So, if, if you go back to chapter 21, and you look at verse 1, as I have written here, words must be, we must consider our new and first. Those are the words there that you have to look at in the Greek. Um, Protoss we've already examined for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Um, new is another word that that um, we can look at now. New, kenos, has to do with um, a refreshing. 
or restoration or renewal. There's a couple different words in the Greek for new. This one is the same word in the Greek that is used with respect to you and me. When we come to Christ, we get a new heart. Or we become a new cre creature, a new creation. Now, folks will go into um, 1 Peter 3 and will say, well, 1 Peter 3, that's, you know, uh, the heavens will roll up like a scroll and, and all this big, fiery new heaven and new earth kind of a thing. And they'll just take that part very literally. So we need to examine, for the most part, unless we've got good reason not to, I definitely agree that we need to go literal is, should be our first stop unless it doesn't fit and then we've got to say well is there no way to look at this because the thing with new heaven and new earth and, and jamming First Peter 3 in here in Revelation somewhere between Revelation 20 and Revelation 21 is that John remarkably doesn't even mention it I mean if there's all these fireworks the obliteration of the heavens and the earth and of this big fiery thing that goes on, it'd be remarkable that John doesn't even mention it, right? Well, so what does that mean? So we could, I'd say there might be, what we want to do is re-examine and say, well, am I understanding First Peter correctly? Because obviously the same Holy Spirit who inspired First Peter 3 also inspired Revelation 20 and Revelation 21 and the rest of the book. And what we will look at, too, is um, the parent passage for 1 Peter 3. And that's all the way back in Isaiah, Isaiah 65. So we need to look at context there and see where it came from. We've already found some places before where um, in Revelation, things become clarified when we go into the Old Testament. We go, oh, that's how it's used there. Okay, now I get it. Whether it's a description of a beast that has to do with kingdoms or, um, you know, the Israel getting on the wings of an eagle and being rescued, and, and then we see that in Egypt, that kind of stuff, you know, so it's kind of interesting. So we need to continue doing that, and we compare Scripture with Scripture, and that's to get proper context and proper meaning. That's what we always need to do, right? Um, again, remembering that in Hebrew writings in particular, um, that hyperbole is um, used very often. Um, hyperbole just being exaggerative language to make a point. And we've given this example before, or to stress a point like, uh, I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Doesn't mean literally necessarily that I've told you a thousand times, it just means I've told you a lot. Um, or when I got in trouble, sometimes my mom would say things like, you know, um, if you don't get in there and clean up that room like I told you to, I'm going to slap you in the middle of next week. You heard that a lot, right? I heard that a lot. Yeah. Sometimes I still do in the back of my mind, you know, when I'm looking at something that needs to get taken care of. Parenting. Yeah, that's, yeah. Parenting 101, I guess. Yeah. So. I told you once, I told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we need to say, we always need to look and consider, well, is, is this what it, what's at work here in either passage? So these things should always be in the, in the back of our minds. Um, let's take a look here. Um, but still, before we get there, let's, let's look at the word new because that's where we start off with this passage. And I just want you to have these thoughts in the back of your mind. So here's an example of new. Um, Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Uh, Ephesians 4.24, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Revelation 21.5, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. So obviously it's not necessarily out of whole cloth. There's nothing completely destroyed, nuked, it's gone. Come in and, and, and do something completely unique that's never 
been seen before. Um, as this says here, over the years, many have assumed annihilation of the old in favor of the new. But what might we infer from Old Testament texts? Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15. The Lord said to Abraham, or to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. So, this question also came up in my mind, is that how is this land going to be given to the descendants forever? How is that possible if everything's going to be nuked and roll up like a scroll and completely recreated out of nothing? There are another passage that's similar is Genesis 17, 8. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. You see the problem here? So if you have Genesis or Genesis, Revelation 21, if everything's supposed to be rolled up like a scroll, completely nuked and remade out of whole cloth, rather than restored or refreshed or renewed, then we've got a problem because God has his promises and God keeps his promises, right? So those are the and there are, are many such passages. Um, Isaiah eleven. And we're gonna look at I'm starting at verse 6. Um, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. We all know this is kingdom, right? The millennial period. Now, for the older folks, they say the millennium is right now, but it's not literally a thousand. It's figurative, but also that it's... Um, the millennial kingdom is really going on in heaven. So, then we've got an issue because are you having cattle and goats and calves and kids, the children leading them in heaven right now? So it's kind of hard. Um, but this is a, a famous passage we should be familiar with. Verse 7, the cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, says the earth. It doesn't say heaven. Wait a minute, how does that work? See, if you're all millennial, you got a problem there. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we can configure scripture all we want to try to fit our paradigm but we need to be honest with scripture and what's going on when and and uh, what the timing of things are where things are taking place and if, even if that means a reset I did a reset and some people can do it really quick but I couldn't I had to process over months and months and poke holes in it and I kept asking people about it and trying to get people to poke holes in it um, Romans 8, Romans 8, verses 19 to 22. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of uh, bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So looking at the timing of this, for instance, um, when would the earth be uh, set free and done groaning and looking at deliverance? When would that time period be? What makes sense? Does it make sense after the tribulation and going into the millennial, millennial kingdom? Well, if it's getting ready to be destroyed after a thousand years, is it looking forward to that? 
you know, that's the thing. Is it going to be refreshed and, you know, what's the language here trying to tell us? And for the millennial folks, too, you got to wonder, they'll try to say, you know, well, that doesn't make any sense because you got the millenniums right now and, and creation being set free is not till they're at the end of the thousand years. Well, they've they got issues if they try to jam this passage here at the end of the thousand years. So the timing of things matter. Some of these passages, you've really got to work hard and, and, and bend into a theological pretzel to make it fit outside of the, of the model that we're talking about here. Tribulation period, and then um, the mortal survivors. Now, some people will look and say, well, then the same revelation that, uh, you know, uh, everybody passes away, everybody dies, that kind of thing. Well, no, it doesn't, because if you read the Old Testament, you know that there's a, a place where we've gone through uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, one of those older Bible studies about how that there's kind of a haven that the Lord set apart in the land of Edom and Moab, what's modern day Jordan in there. So some people are hiding out there. So there's going to be some mortals who make it. And Jesus also said that, um, that except those days be short, no flesh would be saved, implying that flesh will be saved. So those days are shortened, not because some people want to take it, make it literal. The days are shorter now. You know, they're only 18 hour days. What are you talking about? Um, the days are shortened because if men were permitted to go on and the Antichrist go on during the tribulation period in particular, everything would be moved and wiped out and everybody would die and everything would be polluted and there'd be nothing left and there would be no mortals to enter into the kingdom. But the days are shortened by Christ at his second coming. Um, so let's, let's take a look. I, I can go on some rabbit trails here, but uh, Psalm 105, verse 6 says, O seed of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Now you got to look at that and say, a thousand generations, it's a pretty round number. Is that literal? Uh, it could be, but... Thousand is the biggest number they knew, and he could just be saying that because uh, he's talking about forever. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. So he's there is just using figurative language, and I think we can say that um, by the context because he's talking about forever. So thousands, you know, if we were to say it today, because our language has changed from their language, where a thousand was, you know, the biggest term they knew back then, they, they would say back then, they'd say, you know, a million generations, and that means that pretty much says what you're trying to say, that, you know, a billion, or a zillion, whatever, because we, we're going to reach out to talk about whatever type of language we would use to talk about something being so ridiculous, ridiculously far into the future, far flung into the future, that it's a number that's incomprehensible. So that was kind of incomprehensible to them, is a thousand generations, it's really big. So, um, kind of like um, what I, I love you, I love you 3,000 or what, I love you 2,000 or whatever. Three, two, is that what it is? Okay. If you're a little kid, that means a lot. Okay. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, verse 10, then he confirmed, confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, everlasting saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. So it's their inheritance, and it's forever. So this is a promise that is also confirmed in the Psalms. We have it confirmed through Paul in, in um, Romans chapter 9 through 11, just to confirm again and to nail down that God is not slack in his promises to Israel. And a lot of people don't get this, and I, I guess it bears stressing again until everybody does understand it. Um, and that is that there's a difference between a covenant that's a two-sided covenant, like a handshake deal that two folks might make, and God's promises. And I remember, I, you know, I, so much um, love and, and respect and honor for R.C. Sproul. I remember listening to a sermon by him one time, and he was talking about Israel 
and um, Israel rejecting the Messiah, and so um, some of these promises now that you know they're missing out on, and that you know th these things have now somehow they get passed on to the church. Well, we get ad adopted into Abraham's family, so we enjoy all the same things that Israel enjoys, but nothing says that they're permanently out of the picture, quite on the contrary. So what we saw in the covenant promise between Abraham and God is the um, they get together and Abraham says to God, you know, yeah, um, no offense, but how do I know you really mean this? You know, how, how do I know you're going to keep this as a promise? Because we have the promises of the Old Testament. We have a pattern. We've seen God fulfilling his promises and keeping his promises all through the ages. We have the New Testament and so forth. And poor Abraham didn't have all that, did he? Um, did Abraham even have the Pentateuch? You know, did he have the law, the books written by Moses? We don't even know that he had Job. I don't know exactly, you know, there's debate about, you know, the timing of Job and all that kind of stuff, but he didn't have much. So how do I know you're, so God dipped into Abraham's culture of the day in his part of the world. And that was you take these animals these very, and you split them down the middle or whatever, you divide them up and you walk among the pieces. And now if the two walk among the pieces together, um, that signified that if you break this covenant, these pieces are what's going to happen to you. Or if I don't keep my promises, these pieces are what's going to happen to me. So very strong and colorful way of saying that I'm going to keep this promise, this covenant with you. If one person walked through the, all the animal pieces that they sacrificed laying on the ground, um, then it was a promise. The other person's not obligated to keep it, but the person cutting up the pieces and walking among the pieces, it's a promise, and he's obligated to keep it. Well, Abraham's off on the side, Sleeping. sitting on the sofa or whatever, lounging. Well, Abraham's, and, and probably pre-incarnate Christ is probably a Christophany. Um, comes down before Abraham, and it's not the only time Abraham will see him cuts up the pieces and he walks among them and he makes a promise with Abraham all these eternal and everlasting promises we see here. Meaning that Israel is not, not only is Israel not obligated to keep their side of the contract, the covenant in order to appreciate them um, do you th not think that pre-incarnate Christ, that eternal God knew that there's no way they're going to keep them, that man is incapable of keeping all these things. Paul used this in Romans chapter 11 to illustrate that, you know, concerning the promises of God, you know, you should be careful about that. And if you think that God was slack in this and not, in, um, and not keeping his promises with Israel, because what about your own very salvation? It's just as at risk as Israel then, if it can be broken it, because one person or the other did not keep the contract, because are we capable of being sin-free and being in a condition? Did we do anything to get saved ourselves? Did we do anything to keep it ourselves? Or is it God who keeps us saved because of his promises to us? It doesn't depend on us, thank God. <laughs> Yeah, that would. I like what MacArthur said about that. He says, if anything you could do to lose your salvation, you would. You would. You would. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Amen. So, God is, is. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, it never says, like, an if, like, if you do this, then I'll do this. So, yeah. we, we assume that he's, you know, it's not dependent on anything that. We're doing. But, right. Yeah, some, well, of, some of the promises to Israel are conditional. If you mm -hmm. keep my statutes, whatever. Mm -hmm. But some of them are unconditional. Just this is what I'm going to do. And, you know. Well, and some of them are, are conditional, but not forever in the sense of, for instance, again, 
I feel like I'm picking on all millennials. All millennials <laughs> will look at Joshua. I've been into it this week. All millennials will look at Joshua and say, look at right here, it's fulfilled. And here it is in Isaiah. They came to the land. God says, I kept my promise. There you are, you're in the land. And it's true. Did, did they possess all the borders of Canaan at the time when Joshua came and they crossed over? Well, no, but that's part of the promise. But even if they did, part of the, there was conditional in that, you know, if, if you can do this and if you can maintain this and not worship other gods and so forth, then you'll be living in peace forever and ever. Um, so did Israel stay away from other gods? And, and <laughs> no, repeatedly. They, so the last piece, how many times did Israel find themselves enslaved by other nations? Yeah, I mean, just repeatedly. So, but God's eternal promise, as we read in Romans 11, is still in play. So they temporarily lost it, like a disciplinary kind of thing. It is judgment, but it's not eternal judgment. They will get um, the promised land of Israel and they will have it forever and ever, but meanwhile, there's a discipline that's going on. Just like the promised land when they're wandering in the wilderness, right? Israel, by the way, gets a bad rep for, um, you know, out there lost in the wilderness, don't know, didn't somebody know how to stop and ask for directions and those kinds of jokes that people make. But you know what? Guess what? Um, they went where they went in Israel because by day, if they didn't move and break camp, by day they followed a cloud probably a pillar, probably God's glory, who knows what that looks like exactly, and at night, a pillar of fire, right? So God led them. God intentionally kept them out there for 40 years because he was purifying them, right? He's, you know, separating the sheep from the goats after a manner there too because they were not all saved. And so God had to flesh out um, a whole generation before they moved into the land. Did God keep his promises to Israel and get them into the land? Yes. N not the generation that started off from Egypt because they were grumbling, they were grumbling, going after other gods, complaining about the manna, I want ribs, I'm tired of manna, you know, manna this, manna that, I'm tired of it. God sends them some quail. They still grumble, you know, so. But God kept his promises. And the same thing will happen in the future because it's a promise that God made um, for eternity. So yes, they got to go into the land, but, but the ultimate fulfillment, there's a, remember, there's a near and far fulfillment in very many prophecies in the Old Testament. Near fulfillment, yes, they got into the land. Yes, they lost it. And temporarily. There's coming a day, though, when they will get it ultimately forever and ever. Um, Jeremiah 7, 7. Then I will let you dwell in this place, the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Does that get any clear? So, 2 Peter 3, blow up the whole thing like a scroll, burn it all up into nothing, nuke it all and start all over. Or, this place, the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. So, is Second Peter three starting to sound more and more like hyperbole? Especially if you start reading Second Peter, you don't get all the way out of chapter one before you start getting into Peter talking about judgment and talking about what God's going to do, what God's going to do to this world. Second Peter two, the context is judgment, judgment, judgment in Second Peter two. So by the time you get into Second Peter three, it's still about judgment. The the fire coming from the sky and all the things that Peter is describing in 2 Peter 3 are the things that happened during the Great Tribulation. And you're going to have fire coming from heaven. You're going to have the sun roast and burn up. You're going to have darkness upon the earth. You're going to have stars falling from the sky. You're going to have all these things that um, Peter was using hyperbole, exaggerative language that wasn't so much an exaggeration. You've got the heavens rolling up like a scroll in Revelation chapter 6, which, by the way, if that meant, you know, roll, roll like a scroll, like in a, a complete and total way that annihilates everything, then nobody would be breathing very long, would they? <laughs> you know, so uh, obviously that was 
figurative language to just talk about God's judgment and the things he's going to do to shake the earth, to rattle the earth, to judge the nations and so forth. So, so we struggle, we go through many verses like this to figure out where is the symbolic language, where's the metaphor, where's the hyperbole, where's the literal, where are those lines? And, and you do it carefully and you go verse by verse and you try to make it fit to where all these passages hang together. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, the Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Uh, same chapter in Jeremiah 30, verse 18 says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob, and have compassion on his dwelling places, and the city will be rebuilt on its ruin, and the palace will stand on its rightful place. So we have this kind of language over and over, and, and um, I, I'm just going through a few here, but Isaiah 55, 12 and 13. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which shall not be destroyed. Doesn't get a whole lot clearer than that, right? So it's going to move the millennial period, the kingdom, going to bring it in and it's not going to be destroyed. Now notice. Notice these as you read them. Again, for the amillennial, does this sound like heaven things or does it sound like earthly kingdom things? To me, it sounds like earthly kingdom things. Uh, Isaiah 27, 6 says, In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will find the whole world with fruit. Oh, the world with fruit. Not the heavens with fruit. The world. So literal earthly kingdom. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. Why would they be glad if they were in heaven? Nothing's changed. It's still beautiful. Start off beautiful, it ends beautiful, right? But if it's on earth and things were corrupted because of the fall, because of the tribulation period going into the kingdom, the, then they'll be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon. Well, Lebanon's on earth, last I checked shall be given to it. Am I, do I sound like I'm picking on all people? I don't mean to. I'm just trying to make a point here. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God, Isaiah 35. Um, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. There's, when is there ever a desert? that needed to blossom in heaven. You know, that's, those are the kinds of things that you look for when you're reading it. Still in Isaiah 35 says, um, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. So that gives you the setting, the context of the whole, whole chapter. Um, this sounds like renewal to me. Um, verse, starting verse 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. This sounds like stuff that happens to morals, but it could be people getting glorified, I guess you could say. Then the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. See, now that doesn't sound like heaven to me. Sounds like God's turning the earth into a paradise, but doesn't sound like an, a heavenly kingdom that's there now. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the, in the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. I'm not expecting you to memorize all these verses or anything like that, but what I'm doing is trying to make a point here about what, how kingdom looks like. It's literal. 
looks like it's on Earth, looks like it's future. In Isaiah 35, verse 8, it says, And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Um, it shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Now, does that sound like heaven? Are there going to be fools and... Are there going to be fools and the unclean in heaven? If this is describing kingdom, millennium. Um, is this going to be post kingdom or you know, after the thousand years? How do you have, what did the fools and where did the unclean come from? No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. But some of the redeemed are fools, is what Isaiah says. <laughs> That's certainly true now, is it not? Um, verse 10, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Look forward to that day. That's all in Isaiah 35. Sounds like Isaiah 35 is going to be a great chapter to really really read, right? Look at, uh, Isaiah's not alone, look at Ezekiel 34. I'm trying to drive this point home, that's why I got so many verses here. And we probably won't get through it all tonight, but that's okay. Uh, Ezekiel 34, verses 13 and 14. I will bring them out of uh, out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. Now, when when did this happen? Or well, when would it happen? When has Israel, like everybody, been out of the land and, and scattered upon the earth? That happened in what? 70 AD, right? When they were all scattered. They tried to come back again, made an effort to come back again about 110 AD. And um, the emperor didn't allow that to happen, and so he had Jerusalem and all kinds of other, other areas mowed under, plowed under, and stuff to say, no, stay out. You're not coming back, and then renamed it, called it Palestine. Okay. But here he says, he talks about a time after that, clearly. So I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams, and in all the inhabited places of the land, I will feed them in a good pasture. And their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. They will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. So this is speaking of a future time. Ezekiel 37 verses 24 to 28. Uh, My servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, not some future remade land out of, that was remade out of nothing. I mean, it could be refreshed land, but it's the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived and they will live on it. They and their sons and their sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. That might describe the prince that we see in uh, Ezekiel's temple later on, starting about uh, chapter 40 through 48. We, talk, uh, we see a prince going in and out of the temple. Little uh, David, well, it says David, um, but I, I, I don't know if it's... David or it's a, uh, a descendant of his. I guess we'll find out eventually. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. So God's own sanctuary will be in their midst. So there's some temple language there. My dwelling place also will be with them. So that's how we end up in heaven with the Lord, or the Lord with us forever and ever, as heaven is forever where the Lord lives, right? So heaven heaven will come down, just like that old song, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. 
Remember that old song? Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, for my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Forever. Amos 9. Hope you guys are getting the point here. Oh, yeah. I am belaboring the point. This is one of the most controversial um, time periods, the Millennial Kingdom, in all the Bible. And among the brethren, heated discussions over this stuff. So I'm trying to... I am belaboring the point. Okay, yes. So your point is... What is your point? <laughs> uh, is it like this, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth? It, yeah, that's, that's part of it. That's yeah. part of it. I mean, we're getting there. We're not done with that. But my point is, is try to get to a literal earthly kingdom that's forever. That's not going to be nuked and destroyed. So it's going to go on past. Uh, It'll go on into eternity future. It'll go on past the great white throne judgment. And what that looks like, the Bible, most of these passages. Are, 20. Oh, that's in 20, verse 20. In chapter 20, that's in chapter 21, and in various passages, yeah, in 22. So your point is trying to show that 21 and 22 are switched. Well, right now I'm just trying to illustrate that it's a little earthly kingdom and that it's forever. Okay. And it's not going anywhere. So we'll get into what the nature of it is, what it looks like, and who's going to be there. So and are you saying the millennium will only be a thousand years, and then... But the earth will continue past that? Or? Yeah, and we have some verses. I might even have some down in here in this, but that's some verses that talk about the sun and the moon uh, being established forever. Mm. There is that language in the scripture. There is language, too, that people will look at and say, see, this doesn't make sense because it talks about the, the in the context of New Jerusalem, and it um, has no need of the sun. But... Because of God's glory shining out of New Jerusalem, and I don't know if it's a prism effect or how the glory of God works, doesn't mean there is no sun. It just means there's no need for the sun anymore. Because the glory of the Lord is going to be shining on the whole earth. So you've got to be careful how we read a passage and say, does that mean there's not going to be a sun? Just because it says there's no need for the sun? I've heard some people say, see, look, the sun's going to be gone. Well, God says elsewhere in the scripture that, He's established the sun forever, just as long as his word's established, his son, the sun is here. I think some, some interesting questions about what the earth's going to look like once it's been there. Yeah. And there'll be no sea. Well, <laughs> according to the... Yeah, but, but when he says there's no sea, we'll get into that, but, but the sea will be no more, but yet at the same time, when he sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives and it splits, it talks about the rivers and how they run into the sea. So it talks about the seas, but usually when they talk about the sea and the seas no more, it could be this passage, the former passage we just looked at in Ezekiel where there's a highway there. So John's there in a certain location in Jerusalem and he says in the seas no more, it could mean, you know, like the Red Sea or whatever, or the Mediterranean Sea. I guess the Mediterranean Sea looking there going, it's, you know. So something's changed with geography. I don't... There's too many other passages that we can look at that show that the language of the sea and the oceans are still in there in future context. But I think he's looking at, um, again, it's Hebrew idiom. When they're talking about the sea, they're usually talking about the one that's right next to them there, and, and you know the sea is no more. The water's got to go somewhere. God created the seas, and again, he saw it was, that it was good when he created it before. He liked it, so... Well, there were, no, there were no seas in the six days of creation. It didn't happen until the flood. Well, the waters. We don't know how to... <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, they're definitely deeper and more now that the, he obviously created sea life and animals, creatures for the, for the waters. So I'm sure we'll see that in here. But okay, Amos 9. So establishing the kingdom that it's forever and... Um, the nature of it, uh, and God dwelling here with us uh, at that time. In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, 
that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the reaper of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. Um, so he's going to dissolve some hills, I guess, at that time too. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people, um, Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Once again, emphasizing that after the thousand years, he's not going to pull everybody out recreate everything and then put them back. They're not going to be rooted out. It's going to go on forever and ever. Because I, I don't know about you, but I've heard that language a lot when, you know, I was, I remember asking early on, well, what's, okay, when he recreates heaven and earth, what's he going to do with the people that are there and he creates everything and then put them back? How's that, you know, so, and then since then I've found all these verses and, and I've had to rethink it. That's why I came up with being a restorationist as opposed to God nuking everything and starting all over from whole cloth. Almost like Genesis all over again. Uh, Isaiah 9, 7, there will be no end to the increase of the government of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. So the kingdom that God establishes during the millennium, is there's going to be no end to it. So it's going to continue after that, right? On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So he's enthusiastic to accomplish it. He's sovereign God. And in his zeal, he's going to make it established forever. Micah 4, 7. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. I like that language from now on and forever. Just emphasize that I'm not just being exercising hyperbole and saying, hey, that's been up and it's been there forever. You know, that's hyperbole. We'll do that sometimes. Oh, man, yeah, that restaurant, it's been there forever. In other words, meaning we might say, yeah, I've, ever since I can remember. But from now on and forever, the Lord's trying to emphasize here in different books and things that, no, no, I mean really forever. Um, as the establishment of this kingdom is said to continue forever, we can only conclude that at uh, a thousand years will come the final decision time for the mortals, followed by the great restaurant judgment, then we move on to eternity future with whatever the Lord has planned for us all, including the continuation of his kingdom on, on earth. So the big passage in Second Peter, let's, let's go there since I've been talking around it. Um, Second Peter. I believe what we have here is I lost my, my verse here. Is this this is chapter two? Three. There's this three here? Yep. For they deliberately overlooked the fact that yeah. For they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Now I want to use that language there about perishing because this is the same word here to talk about the flood. Now, was the, did the flood completely wipe out and destroy the whole earth to where it didn't exist anymore? So just because it, the language Peter uses, I'm trying to establish a pattern here with words that Peter uses. So talking about judgment, talking about the flood, Peter says the world perished. So that's what I wanted to establish there. You know, we're not quite ready to get the Second Peter 3 yet. Um, I want to make this point first. Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered into the ark. Um, Isaiah 65. For behold, 
verse 17. This is the parent verse I was talking about with 2 Peter 3. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Now this, this is the same thing as we've got um, John talking about in um, Revelation 21, right? New heavens and new earth. So look at the timing of this. So we've got new heaven and new earth. What happens next or what happens in this context of this? And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Is that literal? We're not going to remember this stuff anymore. I kind of would miss the whole point, but what it means is that it's not going to become a deal, a thing, an issue with us where we're depressed or sad or whatever over things that happened in our past, a lot of regret and remorse and things. And the form of things shall be remembered, uh, shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Because the contrast is going to be so stark and so beautiful. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I, I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So we've got the new heaven and new earth, and we've got this in the context of, of um, millennium. Let's keep going here. Look at verse 20. Because no more, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being one hundred years old shall be accursed. So we're talking about kingdom here. You've got new heaven and new earth, but you've got an old man and an infant, and you've got a sinner here. So that the new heaven and new earth is right before the kingdom, because we're talking about millennial kingdom here in the context. They shall build houses and inhabit them, just as the other passage we just read. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall uh, long enjoy the work of their hands. So we're talking about kingdom. So starting back earlier in Isaiah 65, new heaven and new earth happens at the beginning of the millennium, the beginning of the kingdom, not afterwards. And that's according to six, Isaiah 65. Um, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, uh, for they shall be the descendants of the dust of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Remember, this is famous millennium kingdom verses here. The lion shall eat straw like the ox and dust shall be the serpent's food. And they shall not hurt nor destroy all um, in all my holy mountain says the Lord. So this is all kingdom verses, but what kicked it all off in Isaiah 65 was new heaven and new earth. So that's the thing I wanted to, to emphasize here. We, um, this might be a good place to go ahead and break because there's more to go into, but what we're going to do is um, at, at this point, now we've looked at kingdom and established the kingdom is forever, established it's Israel, new heaven and new earth starts before the kingdom. I think with that passage there in Isaiah 65, we've just demonstrated that Revelation 21, new heaven and new earth happens before chapter 20, right? Now what we just read in, in Isaiah 65. New heaven and new earth, and then he describes what's going to happen in that new heaven and new earth, the kingdom, in Isaiah 65. So I think we've established that. So what we'll do next time then is we're going to get into further description of um, some of these things like the New Jerusalem of what that looks like. There's some interesting things to read about New Jerusalem, what it's going to be like inside. And what, we'll, what I will hopefully show next time is that a lot of these verses and passages that we've read in the past concerning um, New Jerusalem, 
we have often been told that, well, that's heaven. That's what it's like in heaven. Oh, this is what it's going to be like in streets of gold in heaven, this kind of stuff. Well, yes and no. Heaven is what? Wherever God is. Wherever God is. But we're told Jesus has one of his thrones in New Jerusalem. Uh, are there streets of gold in, in heaven before the throne of God? Right now, there could be. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that there's not. But when we go into some of these verses here, we'll look and see that we'll establish, I hope, we can establish that here's the context, New Jerusalem. So we have these this tree of life with leaves that are for healing for the nations. Why would the nations need healing if it's after the thousand year reign and everybody's got everybody's immortal now? Why would the nations need healing? What do you need those healing leaves for? See, so set in the context, we return with Christ. We're in New Jerusalem. That's our heavenly home. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am. You'll be forever. We return with Christ. New Jerusalem returns with Christ. He says, uh, in my Father's um, mansion are many rooms, is the better translation. So he goes away and he prepares a heavenly place for us. We're going to be introduced to that in Revelation 21. And as we're introduced to it in Revelation 21, the angel points to New Jerusalem and says, hey, you know, let me talk to you about the bride now wife. And he's pointing at New Jerusalem. Why? Because it's identified with us because it's our dwelling place. Just like heaven knows means the same thing as saying God knows. Because the dwelling place is, you know, heaven is identified with God. New Jerusalem is identified with the church, the bride of Christ. So we'll find that we return with Christ. We're not going to be hanging out up there for a thousand years and waiting until after the thousand years and then return later while he's been down here partying on earth. So we'll get into some of those descriptions. Okay, so meanwhile, I know there's a lot of verses, a lot of information, and it's a little bit of a paradigm shift from what we're usually taught in Sunday school classes and sometimes from the pulpit, whenever a pulpit does, a pastor from, does talk about it from the pulpit, it's a little bit different. And that's why now I will say that I'm pre-trib, pre-mill, I'm a restorationist, as opposed to, because I can't, there's not a term for it. I found some other Bible teachers out there who believe to Isaiah 65 for what it says, that new heaven and new earth is at the beginning of, of the millennium, at the beginning of the kingdom. But I've never read where there's a name for it anybody's come up with, and, and for lack of a better name, just to... to you know, call it something short as a quick reference. I'm a restorationist. So, um, I, I don't know if you'll get there at some point or if you disagree, but we can talk about it more and we can talk about it more next week. Read it some more. Tell me what you think. Meanwhile, any more questions? So, the post millennial view, they also believe we're in the millennial right now. Oh. No, they believe, not that we're in the millennium now but that we're working toward kingdom mm -hmm. so we're trying to get it better and better through our influence as salt and light on the earth and whatever else there'll be a literal kingdom on the earth not necessarily a thousand years but there'll be a kingdom on the earth and maybe forever or whatever but it's it's literal on the earth eventually the millennial view um so it's kind of a post mill. So is it like um, all before millennium. the Lord comes back? Though? Uh, post post millennial in terms of where the rapture occurs is at the end of the millennium. Mm -hmm. Christ doesn't come for the church at the beginning. Right. The tribulation it comes mm -hmm. at the end of the millennium once, and mm -hmm. the church is caught up there. Okay, so it's like a gradually becoming. The new heaven and the new earth? Yeah, okay. things are improving. Amillennial. Right. That's similar to that. Amillennial, the main difference is amillennial is the kingdom is, is right now, but it's in heaven. And the saints are sitting on thrones in heaven now, and they're enjoying kingdom right now in heaven. Uh, that And, and Satan has uh, somehow been bound right now, at least uh -huh. figuratively in some way. He can't influence and disrupt the preaching of the gospel and all those kinds of things. 
it's, it's, it's tough because you've got verses that say, for instance, he's like a lion roaring in the streets, seeking whom he may devour. And you also have him called by Paul the god of this age, the god of this world, this world system. Mm -hmm. So hard to do that from in prison. But. So when Satan's bound, the, uh, his um, demons. demons will also be back there. Yeah, I think that's implied. I think we can safely say that. Yeah. So look at during the millennium, there'll be a thousand years. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So now you have to resort some things and make sure that you're all, understanding. All the people who are living in the millennium can't say the devil made me do it. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the point. Yeah. I think that's part of the point of it. You know, for one thing is that that's God's ongoing mercy and redemption is going to continue, just as there are people saved through the tribulation. There will be the need of salvation in the millennium. You can't say, as you said, the devil made me do it. Um, but people will still be capable of of sin and you'll have you know believers moral believers will keep sinning just like we do now uh, except without we don't need demonic influence or satanic influence to you know have Christ on his throne you'll have um, and some people you know I've even read where a couple of people kind of chafe at the whole notion of what you mean you're, you're going to have these uh, immortal glorified body people living at the same time with mortals and coming back and forth among intermingling on the earth that's crazy well to me the whole thing's crazy it seems kind of mind-boggling that anybody living during the millennium would not become a believer yeah well, it seems i feel the same way too about the tribulation when you're seeing things falling down and demonic possession and things happening around the earth and demon possessed people running around murdering and raping and doing all the things they're doing and you see the events in scripture taking place and people don't repent. They got doubled down and continue to worship the dragon. So same type of thing. <laughs> so we just see that yeah. So New Jerusalem will come down. We will be there. The millennium is happening on the earth with mortals. Mm -hmm. And then if they believe and die, they will go to heaven. No, uh the, the scripture doesn't talk much about them dying other than if, um, you know, other than um, yeah. hyperbolic kind of language, just to kind of illustrate, you know, that if, if you die when you're 100, you'll be considered a baby when you die. Kind Which of means a, maybe somebody would die when they're 100. Uh, well, it talks about, I guess, sinners dying, yeah. sinners dying at, a, oh. at 100, that kind of stuff. So okay. they so die, they're probably, they're probably, they're probably, they're probably, they're about, their souls are probably going to Hades. They'll live until the end of the millennium when the devil will be let loose and then the bad people will... Um, They'll choose this day yeah. whom they will serve. Yeah, some people then will bat some bad people. people. Then what happens? <laughs> this we don't know. I mean, we know we know that you know. Obviously, the you those who are saved. Sometimes. Yes, yeah. those who are saved are going to get glorified yeah. bodies. Doesn't the second resurrection. Doesn't, doesn't talk about a rapture because they don't need to be taken up. Yeah. Because he's dwelling so with us, tabernacling on the earth. They'll get new bodies, glory changed in the, air, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll all be living in New Jerusalem and the earth. Mm, uh, yeah. yeah I, th I think New Jerusalem will continue to be the habitation of the bride of Christ, the church. Uh huh. And old Jerusalem on the earth, and in fact, the whole earth will be restored. Uh -huh. And so it'll be like it'll be like um, paradise, like in the Garden of Eden. It'll be like that all over the earth yeah. again. And um. There's nothing that says that we won't be able to travel where we want in the universe and see whatever things we want. Whatever other dimensions, we do know that, that the scripture says, what, wow, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, it hasn't even entered into the imagination of man. What God has in store. What God has in store. So, yeah. so that's, I think that verse is specifically talking about, particularly, because I can imagine a lot of these things. But I think that verse is talking in particular about eternity future, which is like after the millennium, everybody's been sorted out. The, the devil and his demons are in the abyss. Um, everybody else has been thrown into the lake of fire. Everybody else uh, who are believers are glorified. Um, Jesus, it says in the scriptures, delivers us to the Father into his hands, what that looks like. And then we go into eternity future. 
eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, it hasn't even, it's beyond our imagining what God has in store. On that earth though, because on the earth will still be remnants of the old houses and the jobs and the Yeah, but, we, yeah, and, but they'll be building and doing things and who knows what they're going to come up with. But they'll be, are they going to be different than that might be part of the restoration. Are they going to be? Stuff in the end, is all the people going to look alike with their glorified bodies? Oh, we're, we're, we're are not the millennium the, people going to be like always separate from the other people? Well, the, you said the millennium people that live during. Millennium, yeah, as as the millennium is a time period. It's not right. really. But the kingdom people, people that like the church live during that time. Then the time came to an end. Mm -hmm. Then all that stuff happened. Now yeah, I have no person. clue what we're going to look oh, like. I just thought everybody would end up being the same. Yeah. Not You couldn't tell the difference between... No, I think I mean, God, God is capable of, and he makes us all look very distinctive now from one another. Yeah. Um, even though we're imperfect and, and we're falling apart and the world's falling apart and everything else, we all look very distinctive now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody will look just distinctive in the future, but just flawless. And... Um, how do you know? I don't know. I mean, I picture us not walking. I picture us floating because if we're up. I think we can do whatever we want. You know, I mean, Jesus, uh, the, the disciples, when Jesus, we've got some clues there, although Jesus chose to keep some of his scars to identify who he is and what he did for us, right? Um, Behavior-wise, we have some clues where... The disciples were meeting in their upper rooms, and they'd be meeting up there on Lord's Day on Sunday. Sometimes we'd have the Sabbath day, and then they meet, go and meet in the Lord's, uh, you know, on Lord's Day, the uh, first day of the week. And all of a sudden, Jesus pops in their midst. He says, "Don't be afraid. It's just me." Kind of a thing. He just, yeah, he just shows up. So we can we're able to move around at a thought or whatever. So we have some hints in Scripture, some things we can do. And that steps up. But beyond that, it's just going to be, and whatever you imagine, it's going to be more, like the scripture says. So interesting to think about and entertain. And we like to rule with. So the uh, mm -hmm. people that are on earth, we like, will probably get like a section. It's like, like you're, you're like, it's like, like, you some that show up, you're like, oh, you're patrolling this road today. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. okay. you'll, you'll know yeah. why you're over, but like, you'll yeah. be over. And that's a good point, too, because we'll have, we are during the millennium, that's just during the millennium, we'll have mortals to rule over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that was my question, sort of, then after the millennium, those mortals will turn in into in their, bodies. And yeah, either glorified bodies or bodies made to withstand damnation eternally in the lake of fire, one way or the other. When you get permanent bodies. Some vessels for glory and some for, for some for honor and some for dishonor, right? Yikes. Um, more questions, comments. It's a lot of stuff to speculate on, think of, think of. And I might have, you know, been created, created a situation here where you're going to be doing some paradigm shifts and you're thinking about going with that if the new heaven and new earth happens at the beginning of the millennium, what does this affect in my mind, in my way of thinking? Because this is the model I've had traditional dispensationalism, if that's been it or whatever, for so long. Isaiah 65 says, shows something a little bit different, and it makes sense. But what does this do with that, my thought on this? What does this do with my idea on that? Does it affect it? So think about those, process those, and then maybe next week when we meet, we can discuss some of those and, and work them out. That's it. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Amen.